Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, mutations happen all the time with viruses, and the Omicron COVID-19 variant is the latest, and it's receiving a ton of media attention. Now, today is December 1st, 2021, a very short time since the first cases were detected, and it's actually the first, um, the day of the first case that was reported here in the U.S. So what do we know, and what don't we know? Well, joining me today to look at Omicron variant B11529 is Michael Osterholm, PhD. Dr. Osterholm is the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Osterholm, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. It's always good to be with you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Well, last Friday, the World Health Organization designated Omicron as a variant of concern, its most serious designation of a COVID-19 variant. It also noted that the variant had a large number of mutations, some which are pretty concerning. Um, some researchers say that there are more than 30 or 40 mutations in its spike protein. Dr. Osterholm, just for the audience, um, what's a spike protein and how is this potentially significant? Well, let me just lay it out in a kind of a simplistic term. Any time that a virus tries to attach to and get into a human cell, it needs a place to hold on to. It needs a place to grab. And then it needs a place that it can go through the wall of that cell to get inside of it. And in this case, the spike protein is the key uh, part of the virus that grabs onto a human cell. And there is a specific receptor site on the ACE2 uh, receptor is what we call it that those two get together. And one of the challenges we have right now is the way that our vaccines work is they go after the spike protein. And so from that perspective, if that changes, that may change the configuration or the kind of lock and key combination with the antibodies that we make and with the actual virus. And so as you've rightly pointed out here in the introduction, uh, there are more than 30 mutations alone just on the spike protein which makes this potentially very, very uh, dangerous in terms of the vaccine working, but also enhancing transmission, making it so it's a more infectious virus. Okay, and that really goes into my next question. What exactly do we know about transmissibility at this point? Well, uh, we have limited information, but uh, what we do have isn't good. I mean, already, just uh, as we record this today, this virus has been found in at least 25 countries. We've seen it here now in the United States. Uh, in South Africa, and particularly in the Johannesburg area, we're seeing rapid increases in cases, uh, in a sense what they call their next surge or wave. Uh, we're beginning to see hospitalizations increase substantially. Remember that this virus activity really has only picked up in that area over the last three weeks. And we know that serious illness and hospitalizations as lagging indicators often occur several weeks after the first cases begin to occur or increase. And so, up through the early part of this week, people have said, well, it's more of a mild disease. Well, surely the population it was first found in, younger, healthy adults would blend to that. But also it's so early that even with serious disease, we wouldn't expect to necessarily see it for uh, days to weeks yet uh, in coming. So I think right now the evidence so points to that in that area of South Africa, this particular virus is uh, this variant is beating out Delta substantially, which um, indicates that globally we could expect to see this transmitted quite readily. Yeah, and one of the bigger concerns is how the current vaccines will deal with this newest variant. Um, what do we know and what are your thoughts? Well, uh, at this point, we can go back to the studies that were done in South Africa and South America uh, late last year and earlier this year where actually they competed these vaccines at a time when beta and gamma, two other variants were present. Those were variants that did not have the ability for increased transmissibility. So they never won out. You know, the, you might say the king of the virus hill in COVID are you know, the variants that are much more transmissible. And that's why, again, we're concerned that Omicron may very well even be more transmissible than Delta, which would mean that it would take over, but that would also mean that much more increased transmissibility. But when the vaccines that were being studied in South Africa and South America earlier this year, 
actually competed against that beta and gamma variants, what we found was some real reduction, major reduction in overall effectiveness or efficacy in preventing infection itself. But we actually saw that there was still substantial protection against serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so the very first step that we can be doing right now to address and respond to this situation is continue to get as many people fully vaccinated as possible, including getting your booster dose at six months or more. And that would be right now the number one thing we must do to try to address this. We will surely be looking carefully at, is there immune evasion, meaning that this virus actually is able to escape the immunity that our current vaccines have helped re, uh, produce, or the, for that matter, uh, natural infection and the, and the immunologic response to that. And uh, as you already know, the companies that make these vaccines are actively working on new vaccines that would be specific to Omicron. So I, I guess a follow-up to that is when Delta was really sweeping through the U.S., why, why weren't we like trying to pump out a Delta vaccine? Because that, that did a lot of damage. Well, actually, the vaccines were quite effective against Delta. The problem was waning immunity. That was different than did they actually work against Delta. And so uh, the kind of response that we had immunologically worked. What we didn't have was a sustained protection. Now with this new virus, with the potential to evade immune protection, that's where it gets to be a problem. So we didn't need a new vaccine for Delta. We just needed more doses. This one, we may need both. Gotcha. Um, I wanna go back to transmissibility real quick, uh, Dr. Osterholm. Uh, the physician in, that's been on uh, in the media quite a bit, uh, she's a chair of the South African Medical Association, said that, as you mentioned, many of the cases were very mild. Uh, I get that that's anecdotal, but we don't, don't we have to put that into the equation, though? Oh, we absolutely do, and I think yeah. we will. Um, again, I come back to the fact who the population was that were infected. Uh, you know, we've seen it here in college campuses where we've seen widespread infections, but not that much severe illness. So that's not atypical, even with Delta. Yeah. In addition to that, of course, remember the timeline. You know, I always tell people to be cautious about interpreting what's happening with a, the infection in our communities per the number of cases reported versus who gets hospitalized and dies. In areas we've had a major underreporting of cases, we can see still the impact of those infections two, three, and four weeks later when hospitalization rates go way up. And so here, one of the ways that we'll judge is this in fact causing uh, severe illness what does happen a month or two months from now relative to hospitalizations and serious illnesses? In addition, I might add, one of the other challenges we have right now is the fact that uh, it's very likely based on the mutations we see that this virus may actually uh, really not be impacted substantially by treatment with the monoclonals. Yeah. And that of course has been a very important part of reducing serious illness, hospitalizations and deaths is using monoclonals and those at highest risk for serious illness. Well, if this virus is able to get around those, that's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Is that a pretty easy tweak, though? Uh, it may be, but it won't happen overnight. Again, yeah. it's the same kind of situation that we see with, uh, you know, the vaccines themselves. Yeah. To tweak the vaccines right now is going to take at least three and a half to four months before we even get products started to be produced. Uh, we know we have to make the pseudoviruses. We have to look at just exactly what we need uh, in terms of protection uh, based on how does the virus get neutralized by different titers of antibody. And then you have to actually do community protective studies where you basically put uh, this new vaccine into people to see, number one, what kind of serologic response do they have? Are there any hints at all of a safety measure or a message. And then, of course, you then have to once get that approved, as a, we'll call this a strain change, like we do in influenza, and then get it into manufacturing. That could easily take three and a half to four months. And then remember, it's just now being manufactured. It doesn't mean you're suddenly going to have a worldwide supply. So we really have to be prepared in the short term right now that should we see real challenges with this virus uh, and vaccination, we're not going to have 
with a specific variant related vaccines available for some time. Yeah. How about it? Let me uh, switch gears to natural immunity. Is um, any knowledge about uh, how it will work? I mean, previous infections from different strains against. You know, at, at this point, we're in the same uh, boat with that. Yeah. Uh, we surely have a number of reports, people who have previously been infected, who have been infected with this new variant. And what we still don't know yet, though, does that mean that they have mild illness as a result of it? Is that a natural immunity from a previous infection protective, just like a vaccine immunity protective? And so these are going to be issues that we're looking at and learning a lot about in the course of the next uh, several weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me ask you about the where, where the virus originated. I mean, everybody was pretty solid that it was South Africa. Then you get this report out of the Netherlands. They're, they're, they're suggesting it might be Western Europe. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't think that it necessarily means that from Western Europe. I think what they are clearly indicating, particularly the earliest report right now, I think is actually out of Nigeria. But that again was a travel related event. Mm -hmm. So I think that the challenge we have right now is, is that it surely was circulating probably in October at some low level. But, uh, and where it shows up, God knows could be anywhere in the world because the world traveled today. But uh, I think that the best uh, explanation still remains that it likely started in this area, Botswana uh, and South Africa. And it very likely was in a immunocompromised host, i.e. somebody who might be uh, infected with HIV, because the accumulation of the mutations we see would not just happen like that. It literally took time to be inside of a human host uh, and I think that that can be explained in part by, again, an immune compromised individual. That surely could happen anywhere in the world. But uh, we know based on the HIV challenge in this area of South Africa and Botswana, it wouldn't be surprising either. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on the travel bans, uh, not just here, but many countries. Um, useful? Yeah. Well, at first, I think that they're helpful just in a sense to lock everything down to get a situational awareness. You know, what's happening? What do we know? What do we not know? But they shouldn't be long term at all. Uh, you know, I had said earlier this week, uh, in fact, the last weekend, that I thought that in seven to 10 days, at least 50 countries would be found to have the virus, including the United States. Well, we're well on our way there. And as you know, we now have uh, at least one case here in the United States and many more, I think, will be showing up. Okay. So, the, you know, in a sense, the, the proverbial cow is out of the barn already. And, you know, locking down is not going to fundamentally change the spread around the world. But in those initial days, trying to get your hands around this issue, I think that that was a fair situation. But uh, I don't believe it'll last much longer. And I say that because pretty soon any country is going to be banning 50 other countries, not just a couple. And then it becomes impractical. Yeah. I know you're really short on time. So um, let me just ask you a final question. Uh, uh, how concerned are you? I'm very concerned. Uh, you know, as, as you know, I have been talking about this issue of a variant for a long, long time. Uh, you know, when I came to understand the impact that alpha, beta, and gamma had on the pandemic, uh, you know, I said last April and May, I thought some of the darkest days of the pandemic could still be ahead of us based on the variant development. I've been saying that throughout all the last uh, seven to eight months. Uh, and I have a podcast I do weekly in which I actually have talked about that often. And and I actually uh, indicated that, you know, I wake up every morning with this song humming in my head. It's uh, the old Fifth Dimensions uh, song, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, except in my head, it says this is the dawning of the age of the variants. I have been extremely concerned about new variants developing and throughout the rest of the world. And unfortunately, that's what's happened. I think uh, also a sobering note is this is likely not the last variant. And so that what we have to also understand is that we're gonna keep getting these 210 mile an hour curveballs thrown at us. Mm -hmm. And our job is not to be surprised. Our job is to try to respond with the understanding that we can do a lot more vaccine wise. Vaccines are remarkable tools right now. They're not perfect, but they're remarkable tools. Boosting can really in increase and extend the impact that these vaccines have. But as you know, and we've talked about before on this very show, a vaccine is not a vaccination. 
we also have to get people vaccinated. And that's been a big challenge, not just in this country, but in low and middle income countries too. And so, you know, we've got a ways to go with this pandemic yet. We might be done with it as a group of humans, but the virus isn't done with us. And I think that's a very important message we have to deliver. Dr. Michael Osterholm, thank you, sir, for your time and your expertise. Thank you. It's good to be with you again, Robert. Anytime. Thank you.